thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today on this Tuesday morning. Thrilled to be here with uh, our latest Future of Food series, Beyond the Hype. So today we're going to be talking about the future of food with our esteemed guest here, Jeff Kleinman. He Hi, is, thanks for having me. Yeah, glad to have you. Um, he is the managing editor of BevNet, where he conceives, shapes, and manages three websites. One I just mentioned, BevNet, Nosh, and Brewbound, where they publish daily news and host a conference series covering entrepreneurs in the food, beverage, and craft beer business. BevNet, Nosh, and Brewbound are all must-read websites if you haven't already been a reader um, to know what's happening in the industry. And their conferences are a don't miss each year, bringing the entire community together. Jeff has been leading BevNet's edit team for 18 years. So to say that he is a preeminent thought leader is an understatement. He has seen it all. From the wackiest trends to rocket ship brands to high profile flameouts. And it's really a privilege to be able to pick his brain this morning. So, we will have a wide ranging conversation um, covering the history of BevNet and Jeff's background, the state of food and beverage today, and how companies can build sustainable brands beyond initial hype. Um, we'll also leave time at the end for Q&A, so please drop your burning questions in the chat as we go. And trust me, you're going to want to ask Jeff all of your questions because he is a wealth of knowledge. But I'll kick it off by introducing myself um, and then hand it over to Jeff to share more about his background. Um, for those who don't know me, I am Amira Khatib. I'm a vice president at Bluestein Ventures. Bluestein is an early stage venture firm based in Chicago, investing in the future of food. We have a mission to transform the food system to be better, healthier, and more sustainable. And we invest all across the supply chain in food, including goods on the shelf, how goods get to the shelf, and how goods are made. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Jeff. So, Jeff, if you could just introduce yourself further, give more about your background, and highlight what BevNet is. Sure. Thank you, Amira. I'm really uh, just so thrilled to be here. Also very nervous, um, but <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to try and, and share what little I've learned about the business over, the, over this period. Um, I'm a recovering newspaper reporter, uh, although I've apparently been in recovery from reporting for newspapers for about 25 years now. Uh, I worked for daily papers all the way up through uh, about uh, 2002, and then I was a freelance reporter and writer for three years. Uh, I always tell people that if you're going to be a freelance writer, it helps to plan and marry a corporate lawyer, uh, <laughs> which I did. Um, and that went great for a while uh, until we had kids and uh, the corporate law train was no longer one that really worked for any of us. So in 2005, uh, early 2005, we'd had my, we'd had our first child, Charlie, Charlie, and great name, by the way, he's a, he's a fine fellow. Um, and my wife had, my lovely wife, Emily had, uh, said she was going to leave the firm and we were going to live by my pen, uh, as a freelance writer. And I was doing pretty well at the time, but I woke up one morning and looked over at my lovely wife and my sweet son sleeping in that bed and thought to myself, we could probably use some insurance. And so I yawned and stretched and said, honey, I think I should probably get a job. 
And she thought that was a great idea. So uh, I started looking around. At the time, we used this thing called Craigslist, which managed to drive newspapers out of existence and uh, found an interesting sounding ad for a magazine that needed to be reinvented. They were actually just looking for reinvention and it covered uh, beverages. Um, and for me, that was, that was really interesting. It was, you know, a trip into the world of trade publishing, which I think is something that it has really thrived uh, as new as newspapers have tailed off and you know business reporting in general has grown and it was also really interesting to me as someone who studied american studies in college i felt like beverages have always picked up culture really quickly and reflected it back so i was able to sort of rationalize that for myself um you know, I think we're seeing that happen even more quickly now, obviously, in the the age of the celebrity brand. But yeah, I uh, so I went down, I was interviewed on a squash court at a Harvard eating club where John Craven and John McKenna had set up shop in their first office. And they had, you know, John had started John Craven had started BevNet several years before that, but it really turned pro recently. And the website had bought the magazine from, mm. uh, from Barry Nathanson's former employer, Barry being our, our long-term publisher. And they were looking for someone to try and make it something they would want to read. Um, and I thought that I could do that. And, 18 wow. years later, 19 years later, we're still doing it. Um, you know, we've, we still publish the magazine six times a year. We, in fact, we're closing it this week. So we're all a little strapped for sleep. Well, um, thank you for making yeah. time. <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled <laughs> to do it. Um, where uh, we, we've managed to grow BevNet and... Then we started uh, Brewbound, which was something that was sort of dreamed up internally, actually by one of our uh, one of our uh, art guys, one of our you know one of our uh, production and and graphics guys, uh, Matt Kennedy, and a video guy named Josh Pratt. Um, John recognized the value of that, bought it, started plowing money into uh, into craft beer. And then we at actually at the suggestion of Seth Goldman hmm. uh, at the time who he was running on his tea, he said, Hey, have you ever thought about doing something for food too? And I said, you know, we had been thinking about that. So we started up nosh.com, uh, you know, I think in, uh, in 2000 and, 14 2015 and we we've just continued to go and the basic wow. idea has been to serve as an ink for fast company or for the younger generations as a tech crunch for food and beverage brands and it's uh it, you know it's been powered by two things one is that we run it like a newsroom we're journalists rather than uh association members yep and so because we're of no value to this industry if we just write what people want us to write and the other part is that we just follow innovation and tell the stories of these brands and, and create an environment where they can share with each other. And that's a lot of the, the live work that we do. So it's been a lot of fun. Amazing. Um, I think a natural transition would love to hear a little bit more about how the company's evolved while you've been editor in chief. Um, 
you know, media itself has obviously gone through a million different lifetimes in the last, you know, almost 20 years. So how has that shown up in BevNet and how have you adapted the organization to respond to the changing media landscape? Sure. So what's what's amazing is BevNet is a dorm room company uh, from, you know, from the go-go internet days that yeah. survived. Uh, John Craven started it. He wanted, he was, you know, an early coder and started a website as a way to, he was always very interested in the beverage business, but he also just loved beverages. And, you know, his joke is always that he just started it to get free Snapple um, <laughs> by, by reviewing it. So it was a, a lot of work for free Snapple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, but it, it was really, I mean, John is someone who is a real entrepreneur and will dig in to when he has a vision, he he makes it happen. And he's certainly done that with our events, um, with the studio I'm in now. You know, he still puts in a lot of sweat equity with everything we do. And I'm really lucky to work with a guy like him who's just always going into things 150%. Um, and so when he saw something that he that was an interesting hobby for him, he developed a, a business around it. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I just want to make sure that I... I acknowledge to the people who are with us this guy has worked really hard and he's given me a great place to thrive so um That's incredible yeah so john uh you know he started and i you know his wife carolyn was present at the at at the beginning as well and they uh he, they went to work but he was always sort of working with this thing bevnet had a bunch of discussion boards that, you know, to, that sort of help people talk about beverages. And it was a time where you could start comparing notes yeah. on where to, where you could get things made, who does things well. It's a lot like the startup CPG, CPG Slack yeah. channel now. Yeah. And what was amazing was when we went into the live event business in about 2009 and I, i'll circle back to how that happened in a minute but when we went into that it was like these chat rooms which had been going on for you know for 10 15 years had become a manifest phys you know in the flesh yeah and and it was an incredibly positive experience that at that first show that we did to have all these people who'd sort of been kicking around sitting in a room together. And, and it was one of the, the weirdest, uh, most encouraging sort of energies that I've, that I've ever encountered. Um, and then of course the urinals all overflowed. So that, that was a downside, but. Oh no. Yeah. So, you know, in, from about 2005, when we relaunched the magazine to 2009, we went through a lot of the change, you know, a lot of the pain and transformation that the publishing industry faced. So we were fortunate in that we were covered. We weren't the red herring, you know, we weren't covering dot coms. We yeah. were, covering something that can, you know, that gets consumed every day. And food and beverage industry is very resilient. Yep. Yep. And what's even more fascinating is that during the 2007, 2008 recession, you had a lot of uh, white collar people lose their jobs. And these were folks who were well-traveled, have what my father-in-law used to call upper middle class appetites um, and diets and interest in food ways and specialty diets 
and also, you know, facility with the internet and nothing to do. They'd been let down by a sort of, you know, corporate promise, a law firm promise, a, you know, an educational promise that they were going to be secure in their office building and they weren't. Yeah. And they and a lot of them dug in and started pursuing ways to make, you know, uh, what was it you had? So you had the paleo diet, you had low carb, yeah. you had Atkins, you had people cutting oh, sugar Atkins. out. Yep. And then uh -huh. you also had a lot of folks who were cause oriented, who wanted organic, who wanted fair trade, who wanted non GMO. Yeah. Um, you know, the early term was LOHAS, Lifestyles of Health yes. and Sustainability. Yeah. And they poured all this training and intelligence into these startup businesses. And I, I think that we were reporting on that space at that time. And we were able to, I think have a great seat for this first boom of entrepreneurial beverage and eventually food companies. Um, we had taken our hit with the recession. Advertising certainly dropped. Um, and it was also a time that people were moving to that three-legged stool of publication, uh, website, and event. Yeah. And we just started putting them together and it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. You know, we try and balance the show. We don't try and bog it down for an hour at a time. Um, and we have a tremendous pitch slam that people love. We try and keep people talking with each other and we just try not to bore them too much. Unfortunately, you get a lot of me hosting, so that keeps it. Boring. I don't think that's possible, Jeff. <laughs> but uh, the but guests, yeah, thank you the for... guests make it easy. Sorry yeah. Well, no, it's always, it's always the, it's, there's such an incredible, incredible community in food and Bev and there's this infectious energy when you bring people together. Um, like we just experienced at Expo West recently. Um, infectious but, indeed. How many are you? I know maybe started? that wasn't the right word. Um, <laughs> But let's shift gears and talk about the state of food and beverage today. Um, so, you know, similarly to the media landscape, food and bev has changed dramatically over the last 20 years. Um, we've gone from kind of these mega brands like Coke and Pepsi and Oreo to just a massive explosion of emerging brands. So curious to hear, you know, what have been some of the biggest changes from your perspective and over the last two decades, um, you know, what are some of the craziest trends you've encountered? Um, what do you think that corporates should be focused on today? There are a lot of you, but. Yeah. So I think there've been a, you know, we, we've all heard this one piece of, uh, of information from a, I think it was a BCG study a couple of years ago uh, that was, that became, I think, the investment thesis for a lot of folks, which was that uh, basically the majority of growth in food and beverage had come from brands that were, I think, less than a quarter million or less than a hundred million dollars. And many of them incubated in the natural and specialty channels. Yeah. Um, now, when I started reporting, Whole Foods was the core incubator for these brands. And they continue to be in a lot of ways. Um the the thing that's really changed is this introduction of direct to consumer as a as another sort of marketing retail channel you know so it's it's whole foods had a 
a lower barrier to entry in terms of the number of units you needed to get to a limited number of stores in order to get into, you know, and be seen. And being seen in that store was a sign that you were hip, you're cool. Um, you, you, you align with values that, you know, a, a desirable set of consumers wanted. I think some of that has shifted online now. And I think a lot of folks have figured out that if I can be online and in like an Erewhon, um, then, you know, I, I've got to start, but I, I think. Well, what's your take on Erewhon? What so think? <laughs> I think I think Erewhon is a wonderful store, you know, and and certainly I love seeing and doing the pilgrimage there. And it's also a very small chain in a very expensive part of the world. Yeah. And food as fashion can be a great marketing device, but Getting into Erewhon, just like getting into Whole Foods a few years ago, is is a really hard way, I think, you know, presents a really hard way, presents just one stop on a journey for a brand. And it depends on how, as an, as an entrepreneur or as a food lover, you want to structure your company and structure your future as to whether, you know, being really hot on Abbott Kinney is the end I'm all. I'm guilty as charged. Yeah. I was just there two weeks ago at that Venice Air one. So it's it's a great clue as to what's coming out. Yeah. You know, and, and what you might see. And it's also a very exclusive in terms of pricing environment. And not you know at a time when where when consumers are concerned about have you know consumers are always concerned about pricing let's let's not you know joke around like if you ask anyone it does food cost too much of course they're going to say yes it doesn't matter when um but there's there's always a concern that what we write about because we're writing about early stage companies is also something that sort of leans into what the tastes of the funders are at any particular yeah. time. And funders are close to the source of capital and they, they go through lifestyles of capital, you know, and it's not, not everyone is Warren Buffett living in the same house in the, you know, in as my mom would call it, Yenemsville, um, <laughs> for their whole lives. You know, we're sitting yeah. in Chicago, we're sitting in New York, we're sitting in places where uh, things can be distorted. And I, I, for entrepreneurs, and I'm not saying don't go into Erewhon, you know, please do, but recognize that that's, that's more bespoke. Yeah. You know, and so anyway, I, I feel like we've sort of. Yeah. So how, in your mind, how can you tell, you know, brands get that kind of initial, you know, resonance um, or excitement around getting into an Erewhon um, or they have this kind of initial hype, but how can you really tell whether a brand will break out or not? And in your mind, you know, what are some of the signs that you look for? So when, you're, when you think that a brand will actually, you know, has lasting impact. I, you know, I think there's sort of a dis distillation of message and function, you know, a, a, what, what we call consumer education that takes place um, that, 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 that good brands are able to demonstrate. Um, so, Erewhon or other, you know, brands, a lot of brands in Erewhon, not to, not to pillory the, the retailer. I, I think a lot of brands 
have trouble distilling the message down very quickly. And you, you know, you do that through visual cues, you do that through uh, naming, you do that through uh, what your package says. And if there's, you know, if there's time, as you know, someone shopping in Erwan might have, you know, and access to technology and ways of, you know, spending a little more than the couple of seconds you normally have to get your message across, uh, you can be a little more arcane. But if you can't, if you can't do that, if you're, then you're going to have trouble as you move into the mainstream. And yeah. good brands, uh, sort of innovative brands, innovative products are able to help the consumer along the way, I think, in the in the way they present themselves. Particularly, Can you give us an example of that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me let me think for a second. Um, I know I'm putting you on the spot. No, 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 and, and you you deserve to, um, because I'm not making it super clear. But you know, I I've got a Guayaquil here, and they've been yeah. at, they've been at it for a long time. Um, the can itself hasn't changed too much. The color scheme hasn't changed too much. The symbolism hasn't changed too much. Um, you know, organic yerba mate. You know, so all, really what's required is an understanding of what yerba mate is. Um, and that's something that they've sort of nursed along for a long time. Um, and they've been able to, you know, once you understand it, uh, people look at it as a call brand. Um, now, that's very different from Coke, right, which is... It just, you know it <laughs> because it it's Coke. Um, it's hard to, uh, you know, if you ask someone what Coke is, what are they going to say? Yeah. I mean, maybe they'll say it's so, it, but probably it, it's become its own product. Yeah. So that doesn't, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know if that answers your question completely. No, it does. I think it speaks to when you ask that question of what would someone say to what Coke is, they might say it's comfort. It's their childhood. It's their nightly, daily ritual, right? It becomes synonymous with a consumer feeling versus the product itself, uh, which I think right. is how you have true cultural resonance and a lasting brand. No, that that's a great point. I would also say that the reason that they have that sort of level of emotional attachment to it is that marketing has gone beyond in store. You yeah. know, that in fact, you know, and they talk about the value of content for brands all the time. And that's it's interesting because that happens at the early level, right? Your content has to indicate brand personality and and you know, also teach a a consumer what it is you know when you go to what i call air cover you know television billboard radio that sort of mass communication type of marketing that's when again you're able to just talk about the feelings you associate with a brand as opposed to what the hell it is <laughs> and <laughs> you know um I does Coke even yeah. say soda? You know, I, I mean, question. it's a cola, right? But yeah. So I want to switch gears and chat a little bit more about, um, you know, obviously this past year has been kind of rough for for brands um, with some of the lowest number of new brand launches, some high profile failures, and VC money drying up. So, you know, where do you think we go from here? Are we at peak CPG and it's kind of all down here or is this just a blip? What do you think? I mean, it's it's interesting because 
I I think they're sort of a trailing uh, zeitgeist, <laughs> which you know is is sort of contradictory. But you hear things are terrible, you know, as they're starting to pick up a little bit. Now, I'm not an expert on portfolio theory, but in a recent story that I did, it became apparent that one of the issues that the brands were having in terms of getting money out of funds was that the funds were having trouble getting money out of LPs. And yeah. a lot of raises were taking longer people weren't at, and, and I think that was because, and again, this is where it's sort of a trailing zeitgeist. That's due to what had been a, a stock market downturn about two years earlier, right? So people had to move money out of private equity and VC and back into the stock market in order to have a balanced approach for an institutional fund, right? Or for, for a, not institutional, but a, uh, but like a, uh, you know, an endowment type fund, yeah. um, you know, and so riskier investment types like VC, VC were kind of things got tighter for them vc had seen valuations go up from a previous boom in investment in uh in cpg and you know that boom had attracted you know i think what investors call tourists tourists Yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so, and that, you know, that sort, of, that sort of drove, again, drove valuations up even higher. So you have money that people wanted, yeah. to, wanted to deploy, deployed, but they had less of it to deploy elsewhere. Um, and that's caused people to have to sort of bump along for a while. And I think the other part of it that maybe isn't mentioned as much is that a lot of the... Uh, big CPG brands were rewiring the way they looked at their M&A strategies. So, you know, for, and, and this was one of the things that really enabled BevNet's growth as well, was that, you know, around 2006, Coke, Budweiser, soon after PepsiCo, Mondelez, all started looking at the their own kind of in-house VC funds yeah. and we thought looked at sort of you know two-step deals where they would put in a little money develop a brand have right of first refusal you know learn from it suck it dry of its knowledge <laughs> suck the spirit out of it and then buy it um and they you know, the, the shareholders decided they weren't going to be as patient with those, with those kinds of deals anymore. So their M&A strategy started to evolve as well. And they, you know, rather than look at 10 million, you, you know, companies with revenue of 10 million, they were looking at companies with a hundred million, 250 million, that, that bar went up. And so in order to get a return, yeah. I think, you know, the VCs had one fewer way, you know, one less way of, of flipping a company. It, it became more about how do we get it to private equity? Um, how do we get it to the slightly larger VC? So the point of all this is that I think things are starting to reverse a little bit. You know, some funds we know, some that are even you know, interviewing me right now recently, <laughs> we're able to, to make, you know, to close raises. I, you know, I think people are being a little more careful now. We've always talked very, uh, we, we've spoken very consistently about the idea and, and someone made a very succinct way, put it in a very succinct way recently, of you know building a house that you want to live in yeah 
as someone who owns a company. Um, I think there were a lot of companies that were sort of built on spec during yeah. the valuation boom. So that's, you know, pulling back a little bit. I think the next thing that's going to be interesting is how you take one of these companies that's, you know, turned itself into a profit generator um, or something close to a profit generator and say to it, all right, well, now it's time to invest in growth. Yeah. You know, how, what does, what does that culture shift look like? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'd be interested in, in hearing from, from folks as to how you all of a sudden, you know, accelerate from a really, you know, uh, cash aware perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what we'll see with a lot of brands in today's environment needing to, you know, get to profitability and then put, you know, gas on the fire and yeah. survive I mean, I... and thrive in this, in this environment where VC dollars aren't just flowing at them endlessly. Um, uh, okay. I want to be mindful of our time. So sure. let's shift gears and, and before we, we'll do a rapid fire what list of questions before we, uh, turn it over for Q&A. But one last question to want to hear your thoughts on more about the future of food, which I think was a good segue from our last discussion. Um, curious to hear your thoughts, Jeff, on what you think will be the defining food and beverage trends to watch over the next five years. What do you think is popular today, but maybe a fad and will fizzle out quickly? So, yeah. And, and I, you know, I, I, I say this, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know. I just want to make that very clear. <laughs> you know, you don't have a crystal ball, but you're yeah. the closest thing to it. Um, so I think there are a few, a few really interesting things that are happening. I, you know, one is, uh, the growth of cannabis, uh, as an ingredient and the sort of, you know, opening of the research gates around, uh, you know, around this product, um, you know, sooner or later, uh, federal legalization is going to have to take place just because of the tensions that are building within the system. You have half the states where it's legal, you know, or semi-legal. And in the states where it isn't semi-legal, you have uh, this legal gray area where they're able to sell hemp based THC products. So it's like you can sell light beer, but you can't sell stout in some States. And they're, you know, so they're all moving that way. In the meantime, there's a lot of scientific research taking place around the, the sort of THC molecule and, you know, and sort of what kind of food as medicine advances can be made that way. So I think that's one interesting thing. I also am very interested in the veggie burger. Okay. And, and yeah. you know, and, and I, there's, you know, again, there's been this sort of ongoing tension yeah. in the protein space. And uh, it, it, it came to light for me a few years ago where, um, I was walking down an aisle at Expo West and on one side was Ripple. Yep. The, you know, a natural but sort of franken food based alt dairy product and on the other side of the aisle was New Barn you know, a natural, organic, incredibly expensive almond milk brand, you know, and that's sort of your two sides of alt dairy, alt protein, you know, it's either incredibly expensive and very high quality, or it may as well be, you know, one of these 
ultra processed foods that everyone's scared of right now. Um, yeah. You know, and so there, there needs to be something in, you know, something that works for people. And what I keep going back to is the idea of real food. Yeah. So, you know, I, and, and I've, I've told this joke a lot, like I, I'm the kind of guy who goes in and orders a veggie burger with cheese and bacon on it. Right. I think, <laughs> I think that's a great sandwich. Yeah. All right. I don't feel as full. I'm getting a huge serving of vegetables with cheese and bacon. Um, you know, I don't think it's a yeah. burger. I just think it's delicious. And I think that we're starting to move back that way a little bit, that real vegetables uh, don't need to be a substitute for anything at all they just need to be what they are um yeah. so I, I think that's really interesting no um, i agree i think we always talk about it internally as hitting the triumvirate of taste and price and nutrition and i think you see that consumers are demanding to really understand what's in their food these days and a lot of that is simpler labels easy to read ingredients and and understand yeah. also an understanding of why they're consuming this. So one of my favorite uh, sort of cultural things was I interviewed the 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 founder of this company called Green Monday uh, a few years ago. And it was a, you know, from China, an artificial, not artificial, you know, plant-based pork they were putting in dumplings. And the reason that, you know, there was a, that they, that he thought there was interest in this sort of product within the Chinese population wasn't for environmental concerns. It wasn't for, you know, saturated fat concerns. It was actually food chain safety concerns, right? Oh, yeah. The pork was bad. So we want something that tastes like pork that's not coming from a pig that's diseased. You yeah. know, now, now you could make that argument here, yes. certainly with pig yeah. farming, but it's it just shows you that there are reasons that people will adopt things that are sort of outside of our normal conception or maybe the financial bets we make. Yeah. So let's anyway. do some rapid fire questions sure. Uh, sure. and then we'll turn it over for Q&A. So okay. these are some fun ones. Um, all right, you're stuck on a desert island, the classic, but you can only bring one beverage for this unimaginable fridge that you happen to have. What do you bring? <laughs> well, I, I'd bring two, right? Because I, I would, you know, I'd want cold, cold brew in the fridge. And then sitting on top of it, I'd have a, a bottle of Old Forester 1920. Um, how's that? That's great. That's a good combo. <laughs> What's a drink that you think you should like, but you don't? I don't like, I don't love spicy drinks. Um, I, you know, I like ginger, but all the jalapeno and habanero and ghost pepper beverages, even in margaritas are just not my jam. That's a hot take. Literally. <laughs> um, what, in, what entrepreneur do you wish that you could interview that you haven't already? Um, so that's that's interesting. Um, you know, I I'd love to interview Howard Schultz. Um, Howard you Schultz, know, if you happen to be listening, this is your moment. The the other guy who I'd love to have sit down on stage with me, and I've invited him a bunch of times, is uh, Danny Ginsburg, who brought Red Bull into yeah. the U.S. I think is uh, you know he's a he's a wonderful dude. I've I've spoken with him a bunch of times. He just won't let me interview him even if we could talk basketball. So Danny, come on, man. <laughs> um, what is your key wellness hack? Uh, I have a Peloton and I drink an enormous amount of water, ungodly. What's an enormous amount of water to you? Um, I probably have eight to 10 glasses a day and I'll chug like, I'll do the, uh, 
the three or four in the morning right away. Um, nice. Yeah. I, I can't keep up with Emily though. Emily drinks so much water. <laughs> um, what would you be doing if you weren't editing Batman? Um, so I I'm 51 and three quarters now, and I still look at myself in the mirror and, and say, where's the damn book? Um, you know, it's not too late. No, it's not, but you know, it, it should be there. Um, I, I, when I was a freelancer, I had a really interesting story. I was pitching on the Jerry Garcia band that no one was interested in. So I'd love to keep pitching that. Um, you know, when I was, uh, when I was starting out as a reporter and covering towns and covering crime, it's a grind. And I printed out an LSAT. Um, but that was as far as I got. <laughs> so I, I love what I do. Um, uh... Okay, last question. What has been the most surprising shutdown or failure recently? So I don't know if it's a failure, um, but I I think, you know, going back to this veggie burger question, yes. I think seeing so much money pour into, uh, you know, plant-based and and cellular ag has been um has, has been interesting just because there are really it, it appears there are really big scale problems with that space and you know look there are technological solutions out there well beyond my comprehension um my question is are they beyond all the investors comprehension Possibly some, <laughs> hopefully not all. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think but, it is a space that we'll, we'll see evolve dramatically and it, it's already in motion, right? It's happening. It is. So. It is. The question is, which way is it going? I mean, is it in motion as it goes over a cliff? Yes, or... <laughs> that's what I think. Um, so it, it it's just hard. I, I, I mean... There, there, you know, there are very, there are a lot of unsurprising things that, that failed like Juicera, right? Yeah. Style over substance. Um, the idea of cellular ag is super substantial. Um, the question is, is it in style financially a little too early? We'll see. Yeah. Um, well, Tell me that I no know. one is asking questions, please. <laughs> I think everyone's just wowed by everything you said, Jeff. Um, I, and or they're, they're asleep. Uh, no, absolutely not. Um, we've gotten a few questions and I know we're we're at time, so we'll prioritize and do maybe one or two. Um, Bob Burke asks, what are the two to three most interesting products that you saw at Expo West? Oh, geez. You know, it was really hard for me to even get around Expo West. Um, so I'm going to pass on that, except uh, I will say a friend handed me some chocolate that was made by a Russian woman who left the country. And it was just delicious. And the, the form factor was this thin sleeve. Uh, of chocolate it was just it was you know uh, do you remember the brand i'm putting you on i, I don't and yeah. well, uh, she's you know, if they're listening they got to chime in yeah um uh, they they should call kara rubin because she's been working with them um it was super just super tasty and you know very impressive um we've got a few more questions we'll take maybe one or two more um what is your take on brain health products? What will be uh, the GLP one of the brain health space? So, you know, it could could be marijuana. Don't know, but um, I think there are a lot of people who have who've made a lot of bets on cognizant. I didn't sleep well this unit you know, last night, and I was like, God, you know, I need to get on cognizant because I'm starting to think that 
I'm a little gappy in in my recall and anyone who's been on a, a call with me knows that um although i did just win my learned lead division so i feel good about that uh, <laughs> uh but yeah i i you know the i think would it be uh sort of a cop out to say that sleep hygiene is the neck is the glp1 for brain health because I think there's been a lot yeah. of research there. I agree. Um, okay, last question. Um, curious to hear your take on Alan Murray asks any view on psilocybin, aka the good stuff in magic mushrooms. Am I on it right now? Is that what? No. It is? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just uh, the potential. Uh, I, I think there's incredible potential in psilocybin. I, you know, there's, it, look, it's been open for study longer than cannabis. And, and I think there are incredible things happening. It's what's amazing is uh, these studies are taking place while these substances are in this, you know, legal limbo. Yeah. Um, but there are psychedelic retreats popping up all over the place people are you know there are again these sort of steps toward legalization that are moving the ball faster than uh you know commercially than they are in a regulatory sense so i'm i'm really excited to see what psilocybin does um i'm really excited to uh you know see see how it goes but i i worry that um as with all these things the the pharmaceutical companies will either drive it out of business or create an analog that doesn't do that doesn't unravel the mystery of how these things function you know there were really crappy marijuana alternatives that were developed under a regulatory gray area I yeah. think so, you know, but, uh, you know, I, as someone who's sort of engaged in mass consciousness events in the past, there's something amazing out there. And it's always been cool to see the intersection of, of those kinds of products with CPG. Um, you know, I, I always used to say, you know, if you scratch a food and beverage entrepreneur, you find a, a cannabis entrepreneur underneath. Um, I, I don't think that's universally true, but I think, you know, there are a lot of people who just want to improve things in food and beverage. And one of the things that I love about entrepreneurs in this space is their in a business of nourishment. Yeah. And I think that, you know, extends to some of the compounds that we're talking about. So, you know, they, they do amazing work in that. I think that's a incredible note to end on. Um, and just honor all the entrepreneurs that are either listening in or are, you know, in the trenches today, we see you, it's not easy. And, um, it's an honor to have had you on here, Jeff, today. Um, really, really appreciate your time. And um, thanks so much. Thanks to everyone for tuning in. Amira, thank you for having me. Thank you, Bluestein. And um, everyone, please come to BevNet Live on June 12th and 13th yes. in New York. Yes, great plug. Can't wait to see you. Thanks. Bye.